OK, great. Um, so this is uh, some work we've been doing. I really want to point out uh, my student and postdoc, Hitesh and Dimitri, who uh, did uh, most of the work. So um, what uh, I'm going to do today is I'm going to tell you uh, about um, a simulation we've done of some quantum materials. And so I'm going to go ahead and give you some context. And then I'm really just going to summarize in two slides uh, what we've done. And then I'll go back and tell uh, the rest of my story. So the context is that we're simulating uh, some quantum materials. And in fact, we're simulating a particular type of quantum materials. We're simulating uh, frustrated quantum uh, magnets. So these are insulating materials. So there are metals and insulators. Insulators don't conduct. And so the electrons aren't going anywhere. They're not moving. But in spite of the fact that the electrons aren't moving, they still talk to each other. And they talk to each other through their spin degrees of freedom. The spins can be up. The spins can be down. There's some interaction between them. And in particular, in these types of materials, the uh, spins of the electrons want to anti-align. And so now, if the spins are sitting on some triangular lattice, and that's a common thing, or some Kagame lattice, which is this bottom thing here, which is corner-sharing triangles, then the spins can be frustrated. One spin is up, another spin is down, and you don't know what to do with the third spin. And in that case, you can get all sorts of exotic and interesting phases. So at the top, that's uh, triangles pasted together in one way. That's a triangular lattice, triangles pasted together by sides. Down here, there's the Kagame lattice. That's what I'll be talking about most today. That's triangles pasted together by corners. And there are lots of mi minerals in the world, just rocks you might find in the ground that have spins that live on these sort of lattices. Herbert Smithite, discovered by Herbert Smith in the 1800s, Capellicite, Visenyite, Volborthite, et cetera. And so our goal will be to understand the space of phases and to understand what can happen on these sort of materials. Turns out simulating quantum mechanics is hard. In particular, it is uh, computationally hard. So what do we mean by that? So unlike a lot of uh, simulations that people talk about, uh, simulating uh, quantum mechanics is exponentially costly. So if I want to do one more spin, one more electron, it's twice as hard. And so that's, uh, that's a hard wall uh, to, uh, uh, to scale. And so um, as an exponential scaling, there's been about 50 years of doing numerics in simulating quantum mechanics. Some of the first simulations ever were quantum mechanical simulations. And now we can ask, how big can we do? Well, what's the algorithm? What's the exact algorithm? You have some big matrix. It's 2 to the n by 2 to the n. And you're trying to find the lowest eigenvector. And so uh, sort of the state of the art, if you want to use blue waters and you want to do um, 36 spins, uh, we can do that. We can do that for about eight hours on blue waters. So it turns out, uh, so this is uh, some scaling. If we only use 50 knowns, we can get perfectly linear scaling out to that. And we can do. Um, 36 spins on eight hours. So you might say, that looks like pretty good scaling. Why don't you just do much bigger systems? And uh, the answer is the following. The next useful system size is 48. These have to be sort of square lattices. And if you do 48 and you just ask, look, it doubles every spin. How many nodes do I need? Well, for one calculation, I would need a million nodes for a day. I need to do 1,000 calculations to do any useful physics. I mean, you can do one calculation as a state-of-the-art principle. Uh, Andreas Lauchley uh, ran on some German supercomputers, an example. He did 48 spins once. Uh, didn't get any useful physics, necessarily. It's hard to get useful physics from a single calculation, but it can be done. So we're not at the point where we can scale things so that we can do um, many, many 48 spin calculations. So our limit really is just 36. So we're not talking about thousands of electrons or millions of electrons. We're talking about doing 36. Nonetheless, blue waters is critical for doing anything. And the reason that blue waters is critical for doing anything, in spite of the fact that sort of this quantum mechanical problem has hit kind of a wall, is that really uh, this field, particularly computational condensed matter, is really an exploratory one. It's not the sort of field where you say, oh, I have some climate model and I need to do bigger resolution and then I, have some, I know what problem I'm going to run. Or I have some lattice QCD problem. If I just run it, uh, then I'm going to get the physics out I need. Those are all very important problems. Uh, but they're not sort of the model that condensed matter works on. The story I'm going to tell you about, we made a discovery. We made a discovery doing a calculation that I didn't expect that we were going to need to do. It wasn't the calculation that I had pinpointed at the beginning. We saw something weird. And because we were able to get science back on the scale of a day, I can run eight hours, I can stare at my data, tomorrow we can do something different, we were able to make a, a really cool discovery. 
So as I said, quantum mechanics is hard. We're developing, many people are developing. There are good approximate algorithms, but sometimes you need the exact thing. If you need the exact thing, this is the only game in town. Okay, so that is sort of the algorithmic story of what we um, we're using, we're just diagonalizing 2 to the 36 by 2 to the 36 matrices, finding the lowest eigenvector, working with that. Let me summarize in two minutes uh, the slide that tells you what it is we found. You don't want to pay attention for the rest of the talk. This is a good slide to pay attention to, and then I'll get into a little bit more details. So what was the physics we discovered by being able to do sort of this exploratory thing where we could do thousands of 2 to the 36 by 2 to the 36 and things? What we did is we found a Hamiltonian. That's a set of rules, a model for one of these rocks represented by this 2 to the 36 by the 2 to the 36 matrix. We had a Hamiltonian where the number of ground states, where the number of lowest eigenvectors was exponentially large. This is weird. On generic ground, you expect one ground state, one lowest eigenvector. In very special cases, maybe you have two or three. We have like 2 to the 20 ground states. It scales exponentially with the system size. So this is really exotic and really cool. Why is it cool? Why is it interesting? Well, each ground state that you have represents a different physics, a different phase of matter. There are phases like liquid, gas, solid. On magnets, there are phases like ferromagnet, antiferromagnet, spin liquid, et cetera. So now we have a situation where we have a special point where there are an exponential number of ground states, an exponential number of phases of matter that all have the same energy there. What that means is the following. Physicists, one of our hobbies is to make phase diagrams. We say, look, we have some Hamiltonian, some model for our material. We tune some parameters. And we ask, look, over here, if we tune the parameters, we get a liquid. And we heat it up, and we get a gas. And we cool it down, and we get a solid. This is, this is a, a thing physicists do. And if a uh, general uh, phase diagram, you type into Google Images phase diagram, it looks like this. There are some phases. A couple of them connect in some places. but you don't have a lot of phases end up at one point. In our model, in our quantum material, uh, what we find is we find that we have a situation with an exponential number of ground states. That means an exponential number of phases, millions and millions of phases, all terminate at a single point. The title of this talk, talk was The Wellspring of All Phases on the Quantum uh, Kagame Antiferromagnet. This is the wellspring of all phases on this set of materials. All phases are essentially generated they're sourced, they're well-springed at this point. So we have many, many phases that all terminate here. Not only do we have many, many phases, but we actually have really interesting phases. So one of the really cool phases uh, in the world is something called the spin liquid. I'll tell you about spin liquids in a little bit. But in addition to many, many phases terminating there, spin at least one, in fact, we know two or three different spin liquids terminate there. And spin liquids are awesome, and so it, it's cool to have something that not only seems to source all of the interesting physics, but, but or all the, all the phases, but in particular, uh, the spin liquid phase. Good. That's the one-page summary. So if you get nothing out of this talk, we're diagonalizing really big matrices. Blue Waters has been essential because we can do sort of exploratory science. In eight hours, we can get back our answer for these big matrices. And then we can walk around our phase diagram and look at different points. We can see something that looks weird and go in that direction. And the thing we found was this exponentially degenerate point. OK, so let me now step back and tell you a slightly more detailed story about uh, this physics. So in strongly correlated physics, in strongly correlated systems like these frustrated magnets, there tends to be a menagerie of competing phases. As I said, there's an antiferromagnet here, and a ferromagnetic there, and a spin liquid here. And uh, on the Kagame lattice, here's just a list. There's a Z2 spin liquid that, Heisen, uh, that White and Hughes found. There's one, two, three, four chiral spin liquids that various people found, including us. Q equals zero magnetic order, root three by root three, ferromagnetism. In a very small part of phase space, you take your rock, you tune the parameters a little bit, and you get dozens of phases. And you can ask yourself the question, is this a cosmic coincidence, or is there some deep reason for it? Well, I've already sort of let the answer out of the bag. There's a deep reason. There's this special point. But before we went into the, the project, the general consensus was, well, their energies are sort of similar because you've got a lot of competing phases, a lot of competing interactions. But roughly, this is just sort of coincidental uh, at the high level. OK, so now um, question one, why so many competing phases? Uh, point two, let me tell you a little bit about this particularly cool phase called a spin liquid. 
So 40 years ago, Phil Anderson, who coined the term condensed matter, uh, was uh, thinking about things and he said, look, on this triangular lattice, maybe there's this cool phase called a spin liquid. He didn't call it a spin liquid now, but that's what we would call it. He says, look, suppose that uh, we have such a thing. What is the ground state? What is the lowest eigenvector? Well, maybe it's this thing called an RVB state. So this thing here is a singlet, up, down, minus, down, up. That's a quantum state. If you have some pattern of singlets on your triangular lattice, that's a valence bond solid. And now you can get those patterns of singlets to rotate. That thing is called an RVB state, or nowadays a spin liquid. Chemists might, might be, think like benzene. This is sort of a solid state version, a condensed state version of benzene. OK, so we have this uh, spin liquid thing, or we have this proposal that it's a spin liquid. Actually, it's not. How do we know? Well, 20 years of numerics back in the 70s, 80s, and 90s showed that it wasn't. Nonetheless, everyone has been looking for spin liquids since then. Good. So um, what is a spin liquid? I told you they're really interesting. Well, they're really interesting for various reasons. One, they're interesting to theorists uh, because they break the standard paradigm of how theorists think about phases. There's something called the Landau paradigm for phases. It's been the paradigm for how you think about phases for 50 years, and spin liquids don't obey that. So theorists like them. They're a whole new way of sort of thinking about phases. They have long-range entanglement. If you wanted to ask one question, why is quantum mechanics weird? Quantum mechanics is weird because things are entangled. What things are particularly entangled in a weird way? Well, the answer is spin liquid. They're entangled in a way where no short quantum circuit can build them. If you want to build yourself a spin liquid, you need a long quantum circuit. They have fractionalized excitations. That means they're useful for quantum computing. Typically, if I have an electron, it's an electron. It has some charge. It has some spin. It doesn't break up into pieces. But it turns out that in a spin liquid, the electron breaks up into pieces. And then I can braid them, make it non-abelian anions, and there's all sorts of exotica. But the cool thing is that the electron breaks up into different emergent pieces. And it's got topological degeneracy. Topological is an overloaded term in, in physics. But uh, in this context, it means the following. If I take my spin liquid and I paint it on a donut, on a torus, or I paint it on a cylinder, or I paint it on a sphere, it knows somehow. On a sphere, it has one ground state. On a cylinder, it has two. On a donut, it has, sorry, on a cylinder, it has one. On a donut, it has two. So the search for spin liquids has really been sort of a hunt. We don't have a good story for where we should find spin liquids uh, until uh, sort of the story I'm going to tell you now. The hunt for spin liquids is really one of the forefront areas of condensed matter research, and it's useful for things like quantum computing. OK, back to uh, my main story. So here is the Hamiltonian. Uh, there is a specific matrix. It's, if you know this notation, great. It's xx plus yy minus a half zz. So this is like the Heisenberg model, for those of you who know what that is, except for the zz term is different. The zz interaction is different. This is a technical detail. If you know this notation, great. Otherwise, it's not important. So uh, if you take this Hamiltonian on the Kagame, there's a massive exact degeneracy. So here, what we see in these graphs is some parameter, jz. We're tuning it. We're doing lots of exact diagonalization calculations. This is the ground state, the first excited state, the next energy level, the next, the next. You see they all collapse. They all collapse here. On the right, we are doing uh, different SD sectors, different number of spin-up electrons. Always what you see is you see many, many states, many, many eigenvectors collapse to the same energy. Not only do they collapse to the same energy, but they collapse to minus a quarter. Your ground state energies are never minus a quarter. They're minus 0.89372658. I mean, the things that are minus a quarter tell you something cool, some neat physics is going on. OK, how did we find this? Well, we found this because we were doing a totally different project way away from this. And we said, look, there's some energy levels that look like they're kind of getting close to each other. And then we said, fine, we should go explore this. Why were we able to explore this? Well, because we had codes that scaled well enough that we could get results back in a day. And we had the computing time to go ahead and do something that wasn't sort of very concretely specific what we needed for our project. Without having something sort of at the scale of blue waters, this wouldn't be discovered. And really, to bring that point home, this is an important model without the minus a half cz, with like, say, plus cz. This is a model that has been studied for 30 years. People have been doing exact diagonalization on it forever. If anyone had ever done exact diagonalization anywhere near this point, they would have seen it. It's, it's totally like, like, you can't miss it. There are a gazillion uh, energy levels hitting the same point. We were totally flabbergasted this hasn't been known. It hasn't been known because no one has looked. 
No one either could afford to look or thought to look in this regime. OK, let me tell you some cool physics about why it's there. I mean, who ordered that? Why in the world do we have exponential number of ground states? Well, uh, what happens is the following. If you do take this Hamiltonian and you solve a single triangle, it ends up that all of these colored states are ground states. What are these colored states? If you have three product states, A, B, and C, and it's the product over A, B, and C. Again, in technical detail, you can just think any of those colored states are ground states. If I have the sum of triangles, then all I do is I put together, I paste together colors. It's OK, there's that triangle, there's that triangle. And I just have to make sure that no triangles, all triangles have a red, green, and blue. And now we can ask, how many colorings are there on a different lattice? On the triangular lattice, and the one Anderson hoped was a spin liquid, there's only one coloring. But on the Kagame lattice, and the hyper Kagame lattice, there are many, many colorings. Turns out that many, many colorings mean many, many phases. Many, many colorings also mean spin liquids show up because it's one of those many, many phases. How do we know there's many, many phases? Well, if you stare at this coloring, what you see is you see that there's hexagons of red, blue, red, blue, red, blue. And each of those hexagons I can uh, twist back and forth, red, blue, red, blue, red, blue. And so that gives me two different colorings. Then for every one of these hexagons, I have two colorings. Two times two times two times two is big. It gets exponentially big. So that's why there are exponential number of colorings. All right, so what does that mean? It means that there are many known phases that are all going to terminate at this very special point. We have, a sorry, we have a degenerate ground state, and then you perturb it. You change the parameter a little bit in any which way, and maybe you change it in one way and red wins, and you change it in another way and the brown ground state wins. Okay, now you can go to numerics. You can use blue waters, and you can compute a gazillion points. And uh, these are all points that we had to compute on blue waters to get this phase diagram. This was after we had discovered the special point. And what you find is you find that a known spin liquid, in fact, we think two known spin liquids, come down and they terminate at this point. This required a gazillion hours on, on blue waters to compute uh, how all of these things are attached to many of the known phases that already exist on the Kagame lattice. All right, so uh, there are some details about uh, what those phases are. Those are just sort of technical details. If you're interested, I'm happy to tell you about them afterwards. Uh, this is really uh, the conclusion. Um, not the conclusion slide, right? All right, that is a conclusion slide, but not uh, what I thought was here. Okay, so uh, what do we know? Really, what we know is we've been able to uh, take this a Hamiltonian, diagonalize it on blue waters, and find this exponentially degenerate ground state, we've been able to connect it to some cool spin liquids.